Hello there. I know my video uploads have been a little uneven recently, but in my defense, I am in the middle of classes and writing a book, and that takes a lot of time. And while making these videos is way faster, I have to chip away at that. Speaking of which, I should be writing uh, another draft of one of my chapters right now, but this morning I got on to good old formerly Twitter, now X, and it did indeed give it to me. And by give it to me, I mean it showed me a bunch of bad ideas and opinions. Uh, this person was spouting something I've seen about a gajillion times, and I figured, you know, why keep retweeting the same replies and talking with these people when I can just make one cohesive video? Because there's a good chance that some people don't know all of this because they aren't on Twitter or Reddit or Facebook or what have you. And they just see headlines and they're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. Zack Snyder is a Randian fascist? What a, what a guy. That's not the case. So let's just rewind the clock, right? The two cases people have made in existing film have been that he adapted 300 and that he didn't make Rorschach fascist enough. Which, by the way, not making a character fascist enough does not mean you are a fascist. If anything, it implies that your idea of a good, cool character isn't fascist, inherently. Anyway, Alan Moore himself confirmed that Rorschach isn't a fascist, he's just crazy. And according to fellow comic book legend Neil Gaiman, Alan Moore told him that when he eventually did kill Rorschach, he cried, he wept, because he had become so attached to writing this character, you know? You don't necessarily have to write a likable character in the context of the story for you to grow to enjoy writing the character. That Anyone who's written a story will tell you that it's, it's easy to, you know, fall in love with writing a character, and whenever the story's over or the character dies or what have you, it's like... It's bittersweet. And also, if he's willing to die to expose the truth and let people know things, that's not him only looking out for himself. He's out there trying to help the world at the cost of his life, which is self-sacrificial. So, inherently not, right? And 300 people like, oh, it's, uh, that's propaganda for fascism. First of all, no, it isn't. They're fighting fascists. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but the way that Xerxes is portrayed in the graphic novel of which the movie is based on by Frank Miller, he's not a good dude. He's got, like, mutants, and he torches down places. He has that tree made of, like, the flesh of his enemies, right? Not a good person. Not a chill guy, you know? You wouldn't see him winning a democratic election. I'll just leave it at that. And that's the point that we're looking at, right? Because we don't need to look at the historical precedents in this. You know, we're not looking at like, oh, well, historically, how did Xerxes act? What was he? What was Persia? What was Sparta? Greece? Because this is based on a graphic novel. And the graphic novel isn't based in history. In fact, Frank Miller didn't want anyone to adapt his graphic novel. And then he met with Zack Snyder. And Zack was such a big fan and went on and on about why he likes Frank's, Frank Miller's work. According to Frank Miller in the DVD extras for 300, he was like, I mean, I met with him and I couldn't say no. He was just so nice. So again, more proof that Zack Snyder is a pretty cool guy, which has kind of been the uh, opinion of the internet recently. Like, oh, Zack Snyder is a pretty cool guy. Why are all of his fans so bad? And it's like, they're not. You guys have just called them Nazis for 10 years and told them to kill themselves. And after 10 years of that, they're kind of sick of it. Um, but 300 is told from the point of view of a Spartan soldier trying to hype up the rest of the army to go out and win. It's exaggerated. It's not supposed to be taken at face value. And it's just like a tall tale. It's a legend. It's not fascism. It's just a morale booster. Every country in the world does it, regardless of their political standings or political parties. So, I think those are the examples people cite, but it isn't the origin of it. The origin of the claims against Zack Snyder come from none other than Devin Farici. That's right. The guy who started a lie about Zack Snyder being a fascist is a sexual predator. You may have noticed in movies like 300 and Man of Steel and Sucker Punch and Watchmen, and Army of the Dead, the Zack tends to make movies where predatory dudes get their shit kicked in, based, honestly. And so it's no shock that that has created a bit of a subculture of sexual deviants who hate Zack Snyder and use their position within Hollywood's network to lie about him. Because, hey, he's not one of us, he won't be partying with Epstein. Let's go ahead and ruin his career if we can. It's slanderous. So let me read you what he said. Uh, knowing that Snyder loves Ayn Rand 
Ayn Rand's The Fountainhead, a lot of things snap into place, especially things about Man of Steel and Podkin's absolutely baffling worldview. Snyder's an objectivist. He believes in what objectivists call rational self-interest, which others might call radical selfishness, which is the belief that the ultimate moral duty you have is to make yourself happy. Honestly, all of Podkin's stuff becomes crystal clear now. Man of Steel is about a superhero who only becomes a superhero when it is in his own self-interest, i.e. the planet's about to get destroyed, Otherwise, he's happy to keep his powers to himself, seeing no need to use them to help others. So, obviously, we can pinpoint a couple fallacies right there, right? So let's start from the bottom and go back up. Otherwise, he's happy to keep his powers to himself, seeing no need to use them to help others. Well, motherfucker, that's a goddamn lie. The first thing we see adult Clark Kent doing is bailing from the fishing boat he's on, swimming at super speeds over to go save an oil derrick that's burning down and saving everyone at risk of exposing himself. So, untrue. In fact, he gets hurt and then we get flashbacks. What do we flash back to in the movie, you might ask? Oh, I don't know, him saving a bunch of kids from drowning. Oh, okay, cool. So, i.e. when the planet's about to get destroyed. Superman... The, knew the planet wasn't going to get destroyed, it was going to be turned into new Krypton, which would benefit him. He would be surrounded by people who don't hate him, who don't fear him, and who don't see him inherently as an enemy. That would have been easier for him, actually, especially in a movie that goes out of its way to show how nomadic he had to become in order to avoid persecution and fear and hate from everyone around him. It would have been much easier for him to not feel alone in the world and let these alien dudes come back. Imagine someone who could tell you about what it was like to be with, like he knew your dad and your mom, right? He knew about the politics of your planet, the creatures, you know. Zod was Jor-El's best friend prior to their ideological falling out because they were both programmed to protect Krypton, one through the advent of science, one through military prowess. It's a very Optimus Prime Megatron situation, and for you hardcore nerds out there, yes, I do mean Orion Pax and Megatron. It's a really rich story. It would have been easier, because initially, they just need to take the Codex from him. They don't need to drain all of his blood. They don't need to kill Superman to get the Codex to make more Kryptonian babies. They already have a world engine, so they don't need Superman to cryptoform the Earth. He's not at risk of anything. At worst case, he just has to learn how to adapt to not having superpowers, which is probably something he's wanted his whole life. If any of you ever saw Disney's Hercules, you know, kid with superpowers who doesn't fit in and everyone hates and he just wants to find where he belongs. I mean, it's a classic tale. It's literally a classic tale that Disney then adapted and that, you know, Siegel and Schuster used those bones to make Superman, the original superhero. So that's real dumb. Pa Kent stuff becomes crystal clear. Okay, so Pa Kent, his big cardinal sin is what? Telling Clark that he needs to be careful? Because what happens is Lana Lang's mom finds out that Superman, well, young Clark, has superpowers, right? That he saved everyone, and she wants to go to the military. John is like, hey, you can't just do this out in the open willy-nilly. You need to be careful. And, he, and Clark counters with like what was i supposed to do just let them die and his dad is like he realizes that like in order to protect his son he has to put other people's children in danger and that's a, a choice that no parent wants to be in of course he wants to look out for clark that's not a fascist john kent or objectivist I've, even if you truly believe that john kent was saying hey let kids die it doesn't matter i don't care about the other children i only care about you that's still not objectivism that's still a father looking out for his son. So you can still criticize that and be wrong about the situation. If you want to lie about it or be misinformed, that's your God-given right. However, Jonathan Kent is not saying, I only look out for me. He's saying, I'm worried about my adopted child who I love as though he is my own blood. That's not selfish, that's selfless. So, you know, as we go back up through here, basically, Ferici had to lie about the contents of Man of Steel in order to fit his narrative. And he, all, he points down to uh, Zack Snyder bought the rights to Ayn Rand's The Fountainhead, a novel about a artist from humble beginnings who eventually gets into the big leagues but has to make the decision of like, okay, how many changes do I make for my blueprint of a, of a house before it's no longer my vision for it, right? And that's something that every artist who's ever had to be 
put into a compromising situation can relate to of like, okay, well, if I recast this, if I cut this, if I change that, if I rewrite this scene, at what point am I not making my movie? At what point am I not telling my story? You know, and that's not, and this book was written early in Rand's career when she wasn't fully a radicalized nut job, who, by the way, uh, Zack Snyder thinks she was a nut. He said that she drank her own Kool-Aid and she was nuts, which aren't signs that he admires her political ideologies. In fact, he said that he didn't want to look at it from a political standpoint. He was looking at it from the perspective of a creator being forced to compromise. And at what point does that compromise cease to be a compromise? When does it become you've sold out? And if people do want to say, well, you can't fully divorce the concept from politics, right? Like, it's still about, like, selfishly, how can I do this? Well, I would disagree with you, but if you want to believe that, fine, whatever. So I'm just curious, though, are you going to go after Bioshock, which heavily explores the pros and cons of objectivism and literally gives the player uh, choice and, you know, narrative control over what the character does, which means you can play it as an objectivist power fantasy if you wanted to. You can drain all of the little sisters and you can get all the powers you want and you can be an objectivist who only looks out for himself. Are you going to do that? Are you going to go burn it down? Or are you thinking to yourself, well, Bioshock is sort of a parody and satire. You know, as much as it may seem like it's preaching one thing, it gives you choice. It's an examination of the idea, not necessarily, you know, someone endorsing the idea, right? Okay, cool. So what's the difference between that and Zach trying to adapt the fountainhead, but change it to be the context of a filmmaker, right? So... Zack Snyder is not a fascist. He's a Jewish liberal Hollywood director that donates to suicide prevention charities in the name of his daughter. And his fans aren't crazy, zealous fascists either. That's a gaslight. You guys have gone out of your way to lie about him and his fans for over 10 years now, and they're tired of you lying about it. As one person said, it's weird seeing all these clips of Zack Snyder and how people will say, wow, he seems like such a cool guy. How did he end up with such insane fans? When what these people really should be saying is, wow, he seems like a cool guy. Why were people loudly calling him a fascist for a decade? And that's the source of the issue. People are looking at the reaction instead of the initial action, the inciting incident, the continued harassment. And I've made videos about how cruel and terrible this has been. In fact, in my book, I have a multi-page spread of screenshots of dozens, if not hundreds, of horrible things people said about Zack Snyder's family tragedy, about his films, about him as a person, and about his fans. Racial slurs, threats, all kinds of nonsense, in the name of Superman, no less. This isn't an isolated incident, and we need to squash this whole thing now and forever. Zack Snyder was never a fascist. His fans were never fascists. You just didn't like a movie 10 years ago, and you haven't gotten over it. It's fine to not jive with Man of Steel. It's fine if Batman vs. Superman wasn't your vibe. It's cool, dude. It's been a decade. It's been eight years. As long as you're just like, nah, man, wasn't really my cup of tea. Nobody's gonna come bludging you over the side of the head for saying that. If, in the year of our Lord 2023 and beyond, you're saying, oh, Hack Snyder's a fascist that ruined DC and this movie's proof, well, see, now you're not just stating an opinion, now you're being inflammatory and antagonistic and obsessing over a movie that came out in 2016. And we're frankly kind of fucking tired of hearing that. So no, we aren't toxic for saying, shut up, we've heard this before, and you're acting insane. You're toxic for being this angry over a movie nobody forced you to watch. Anyway, all these hope and optimism enjoyers, maybe you should start putting a little bit more hope and optimism out into the world instead of uh, racial slurs and doxing threats. You know what I mean? I hope this helped clear things up. Oh, and if you're looking for more positivity about the subjects of Snyder's movies, go check out the channel The Cultist Cast. It's a channel I'm making where I can collaborate with other fans of Zack Snyder's work. I want to promote fan films, fan art, discussions and positivity. Basically, anytime the internet picks up a new, hey, this is our narrative we're running with to be negative about Zack, I'm going to make a video about how positive and happy and celebratory we are of those things and highlight the discrepancies between their narrative and reality over there. So cultist cast two words or at cultist cast one word because YouTube has ats now. Um, 
and yeah feel free if you're someone who also really likes Zack Snyder stuff or you have you know stuff that you want to show like if you've done fan art let me know we're gonna start trying to do like a weekly hey here's some fan art and review or maybe like a bi-weekly or monthly thing and we're gonna give full artist credit every single time we want to really help you guys grow so trying to make it a very positive situation uh instead of letting the internet's echo chamber of negativity seem like it represents the whole world you're not broken you're not alone these movies are badass twitter isn't a real place